David Ellison is one of the nicest guys in metal. It's a wonder how he can endure and survive the burning passion of Megadeth's Dave Mustang. Nonetheless, Ellison, second in command of Megadeth, has helped to solidify the band into the big four of thrash metal. Let's find out what he used to do that. David Ellison come from a well-to-do family several miles outside of Jackson, Minnesota. He grew up on a farm and pretty much lived an all-good American life. Dave first became acquainted with music as a child, originally playing the piano and the Welzer organ at his local church. It wasn't meant to be for Dave as he exclaimed it was excruciatingly boring. By the age 10, he took up the tenor sax, mostly because it looked cool and women do love a sax man. Dave soon became a huge fan of KISS. After studying the back of the Alive album, it stated, KISS uses Gibson guitars because they want the best. On the back of the KISS records it says, KISS use Gibson guitars and Pearl drums because they want the best, right? Am I like, well, if they use Gibson, then I better use Gibson. <laughs> Following this in the summer of 1976, Dave asked his parents for a Gibson bass, proclaiming in an interview, if KISS used it, it must be the only one to have. Dave's parents found a used Gibson EB0 for $150 or $700 today. After taking the bass home, Dave was disappointed to hear it sounded awful. That combination of a Gibson EB0 with its single pickup at the neck plus flat wound strings was terrible, especially at the volumes I wanted to play it. I got home, I plugged it in and I thought, what the heck is this? This doesn't sound like Gene Simmons at all. And I plugged it in and I was like, this doesn't sound like Kiss, but <laughs> All right, I'll get started. So I bought up my Mel Bay Electric Bass Volume 1, sat at home, and because I'd had the world its organ experience, I knew how to read bass clef, and so I basically became largely self-taught through reading music books. Nonetheless, Dave was committed to learning the bass. All I wanted to do was be in a rock band. That was it. So he taught himself how to play using the Mel Bay Electric Bass Methods Volume 1 and 2. Dave's father, who was described as not having a musical bone in his body, then took interest in his son's new vocation, buying him an Ampeg Dan Armstrong bass. Following this, in 1979 came a Sunburst Rickenbacker 4001. The black pick guard was swapped out for a mirror type guard. On a family vacation one summer in 1980, Dave visited a local music shop and saw a BC Rich Mockingbird made of color wood. These were the go-to cool instrument at the time, according to Dave. Initially worried about the price of the Mockingbird, Dave considered buying a PVT-40. His father then pressed him, asking, is this the bass you really want? You know, it's better to spend more money and buy it right the first time than to buy something you don't really want. He added, if this is the bass you really want, I'll help you get it. Dave proclaimed in an interview, once I got the BC Rich, I finally felt like I was heading in the right direction. At the age of 18, Dave decided to move out and find the big lights of Los Angeles citing there are only a few places in the world to make it as a rock star. London, New York, and Los Angeles. That, and he was repelled by farm work and being told what to do. Once in Tinseltown, it didn't take Ellison long to meet Dave Mustang. There was some guy uh, living underneath me. And I was living right down below. I this on my door, and I opened the door, and there's these two kids. Gives me this kind of like condescending look. The infamous Mustang snarl, and they go, Hey, you know where to get some cigarettes? And I went, yeah, down the street at the liquor store. It slams the door in my face. Hey, are you old enough to buy beer? And I said, now nah, you're talking. We hooked up and went down the street, got a case of Heineken. The rest is history. That's how David Ellison got in the band. Mustaine, who you should know already, was kicked out of Metallica several weeks prior to their encounter. He was currently plotting a path of all-out revenge on Metallica and was absolutely dedicated to the creation of his new band soon to be called Megadeth. I, I was so mad at them and I figured I need to regroup and I need to start over again because now I'm gonna get revenge. Part of the whole reason why I formed Megadeth was to get back at them. After some tribulations and a revolving door of musicians, including a few brief appearances of Slayer's Carrie King, the lineup then fell on Ellison, Mustaine, Chris Poland, and Gar Samuelson on drums. Ellison had originally taken his BC Rich Mockingbird and a Dan Armstrong with him to Los Angeles. The former is seen in photos and live videos at this time. I'll come back to the Dan Armstrong later on. Megadeth's debut appearance was on the 17th of February, 1984. 
Dave himself states in an Instagram post that on this show, he used an NJ series white BC Reach Eagle, personalizing the base by throwing some red paint over the body to make it look like blood splatter. Additionally, he took it upon himself to carve a huge hole in the top of the base to install a Carla tremolo bar. Dave then admitted it didn't really work and ruined the base. I carved out and put a Kaler whammy on one of my, on, a, on one of my bases and be like, <clears throat> and that was it. Hacked my base up for nothing. He also recalls that Mustang wrote the riff to peace cells on this base. And then continues, he's not really sure what happened to it after that. Adding insult to injury, he tried his hand at modding again by ripping the frets out of his Coel Mockingbird in order to make it fretless. This base too was ruined. The first album, Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good, was released in June 1985. During this time, you'll see a few BC Rich bases appear. As Mustaine would admit, Ellison and I were in the habit of buying guitars from BC Rich, and we had a lot of them. Drummer Gar Samuelson was the general manager at the BC Rich factory, and no doubt helped David, Dave, and Chris with a few BC Rich guitars, or at least a discount. Pictures have emerged of Ellison with a 30 inch Rich Bitch H string, a black Iron Bird, a rare headless stealth model, a striped Mockingbird in blue in the style of Eddie Van Halen stripes, and a Mockingbird painted in the style of a World War II fighter. A red Mockingbird was used to record Peace Cells in 1986, and was seen in a music video of the same name. The following video release was Wake Up Dead, which saw the Iron Bird. It was used in a few shows before going missing. It was during the Peace Cells tour in May 1986 that Dave had his first run in with a Jackson bass. First experience with a Jackson instrument was, uh, I believe, in 1987. I went to the Guitar Center on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood and I grabbed Jackson bass. It was concert bass, so I pulled it off the wall, plugged it in the amp, and in that moment, my thrash metal tone was born. In his autobiography, Dave then placed an order with Jackson for a custom build. As far as I can tell, he primarily used the World War II fighter up until winter 1986, whilst his new base was being built. Depending on the manufacturer, it could take several months for a new build. The custom shop Quicksilver concert base appears on tour early 1987. It was fitted with Jackson-made precision jazz pickups, a neck through maple body, and active electronics. It was this base that began Dave's love affair with Jackson bases. According to Dave at a show in Miami, May 1987, he threw his base up in the air, all in the name of good fun of course, only to have it come crashing down, breaking the neck at the headstock. Lucky for Dave, a replacement was shipped in overnight. The replacement base came in a cracked eggshell yellow, which was quickly masked with stickers, notably this afro type dude and a mutant chicken foot. God, it's like some sort of inkblot test. A year or two after this incident, he painted the base gunmetal grey. Dave states, while it sounded good live, it didn't work as well in the studio and was relegated to a live backup bass during a so far, so good, so what tour. He lost track of this bass too. You know, a lot of basses seem to go missing in Megadeth. Dave reports there are a handful of basses that he don't know what happened to, like the EB-0, the Rickenbacker 4001, the BC Rich Eagle, and his very first Quicksilver Jackson concert. Additionally, the Dan Armstrong was reported to be stolen by Gar Samuelson for dope money. The Mockingbird fighter used during MP sales was purchased by a fan at Megadeth auction. This was then donated to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In one of Dave's Facebook posts, he mentions that the Quicksilver Jackson was repaired quickly and went on to record 1988 So Far, So Good, So What. In some of the shows during 1988, you'll also see the Gunmetal Grey concert bass performed on the show's encore, Anarchy in the UK. As previously mentioned, this was once the cracked eggshell Yellow Jackson. During that summer, Megadeth played the Monsters of Rock Festival at Castle Donington, probably their biggest show to date. On this performance, Dave busts out a Candy Red Jackson concert bass. During the US tours, however, Megadeth toured with Dio. Dave and Dio's bassist Jimmy Bain then became friends, and Jimmy invited Dave over. Dave recalls, I went over and he loaned me an eight-string bass. I took it home and started playing it, and immediately wrote the song Dawn Patrol, which ended up going on the Rust in Peace record. I was unable to find any record of an eight-string Yamaha bass. In my opinion, it's likely to be a custom model, as Dave continues. He had this amazing Yamaha endorsement. He had all kinds of basses. Ellison also mentions that the Candy Red Jackson was used to record a large portion of Rust in Peace, praising its ebony fingerboard that had a bright snap, 
which can clearly be heard on songs like Five Magics. This bass was later painted black and appeared on the video for Holy Wars, as well as the Rust in Peace tour of 1990-91. to He switches between this bass and a five-string concert bass. The five-string was featured in the video Hangar 18. Originally, the song was written on a four-string in drop D. It was also the first five string designed by Jackson. Well, I started using the five string. We did the Rust in Peace album. Mm -hmm. We did a song. It needed to be down here, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to. <laughs> right? You know? Just, That's what I do. Right? And then when I got to the second half of the tune. Wow. Punch. And then, and then I recorded the back half of it, but the tuned up. Then I had, then I realized we had to go on tour and play the song. <laughs> <laughs> so I called up Jackson. I said, SOS, I need a bass. And so we basically created a five string, just made a really wide neck, took a P bass pickup like yours, and we just split it farther apart to pick it up. And and so it was really just kind of this poor man's yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, four string turned into a five wild string, west right? pioneer, man. You know, yeah. Towards the end of the summer tour in 1991. A white concert bass appeared a few times. Rolling into 1992 came Countdown to Extinction. It's not been said specifically which basses were used to record it. Dave mentioned in one of his Every Bass Has a Story posts that he had two main four strings on tour, one of which was a white concert bass. It could be seen in a few shows at the tail end of the previous tour and on the Symphony of Destruction video. The second was a precursor to what would be called the Kelly Bird, designed and released by Dave many years later which we'll get to. He had Jackson paint this one Battleship Grey, stating, it's the same color as my Panasonic answering machine. A new five string was spotted on the Countdown Tour. The Jackson pictured here was based on a Kip Winger signature model made for Dave. Note the diamond shaped knob placement. Unfortunately, he goes on to describe the bass as too thin for my stage uses. It was used for a few photo shoots and subsequently retired. From what I can tell, he stuck with his original Hangar 18 five string during this time. During the Countdown to Extinction tour, Dave mentioned he was on the hunt for some new and unique basses. Finding a Spectre NS2 in the local classified ads, the bass was picked up for $1,100 in 1993. Towards the end of the tour, the video for Angry Again was released and we see the white Kelly Bird again. Not long after the tour was finished, Megan prepared for their sixth album, Euthanasia. Euthanasia saw quite a big change in Dave's style. A friend of mine named Ron received a letter from Dave himself during the Euthanasia tour in 1995. It states, I recorded Youth with a 78 Fender Precision for the four string songs, and the blue five string modulus for all the five string songs. The letter continues with amplifiers, which we'll cover later on. A big thank you goes to Ron from New Jersey for sharing that letter with me. Thank you very much, dude, I appreciate it. This change came about because Dave wanted to expand his tones. When it comes to the 78 Fender, pictured here with a maple neck, some artists find that older instruments have a unique tone that can't be recreated with modern instruments. It's a very personal and subjective thing. There are also reports of a second Fender Precision with a rosewood neck, which I have yet to see in the wild. In the making of the album video, we also see Dave pull out a Fender Jazz, Steinberger Q2, and Natural BC Rich Eagle. The extent of their use has not been confirmed. In this program, Dave mainly plays the Modulus, the Steinberger, and the Fender Precision. The modulus bases, on the other hand, were quite unique at the time. They're built with carbon fiber necks and are virtually unaffected by changes in temperature, humidity, and altitude. They also produce a very specific tone when compared to wooden necks. Dave praises these bases, stating, it's 35 inch scale length, EMG pickups, and maple tops make this an exquisite instrument to handle the duties for the album and tour. Its graphite neck provides an incredible stable support and also a terrific snap to the brilliance of the notes. Dave further explains his choices in an interview with Bass Player Magazine. On Countdown to Extinction, we realized as we were playing bigger venues and the tempos needed to slow down so people could actually hear the music. So we wrote differently. This continued through Euthanasia, which is when I started using the Modulus 5 string to get deeper and punchier for the new, slower songs. Ellison quickly became a Modulus aficionado and actively engaged in trading Moduluses in his local community. Originally, an employee at the base place in Scottsdale, Arizona loaned him a Swamp Ash Quantum 5 model. This was then followed by a purchase of the Blue Quilt, which was mentioned in Dave's letter. Two singles were released from the album, Train of Consequences, which coincidentally is inconsequential to this video, and Toot Le Monde. 
In the latter video, Dave plays an Emerald Green Quantum 5. The Euthanasia Tour started in 1994, and Dave originally used the blue quilted modulus. A quilted maple or trans orange, depending on how you look at it, was purchased as a backup for the tour. However, it soon became the main bass instead. This bass is now retired from the road, and Dave only uses it for recordings. Megadeth then took some time off to record Cryptic Writings, released in June 1997 and followed by a world tour. The Spectre NS2 now took the helm to record the album. Dave also adds, I use my modulus quantum five string bass for a few songs, but overall, the Spectre did the job for everything else. For that tour, Dave shares this picture with the following caption. This black modulus quantum five string bass was my go-to axe on this tour. It may also be the one which later sported the pearlescent white pick guard. Released in 1999, Risk received a mixed response from critics. Alienating hardcore Megadeth fans due to its departure from its heavy thrash metal roots to a more commercial pop rock. The general theme of this album was, as you guessed it, taking risks. A lot of these changes stem from a comment made by Metallica's Lars Ulrich. Mustaine remarked, Last album, Lars said to me something through the press. He said he thinks I am talented, but that I should take more risks, which I took as good advice. As this new record evolved, it became more and more appropriate to call it Risk. After all, the band is called Megadeth. We aren't afraid to take chances. We wanted to be our own persons, do our own thinking, and make our own decisions, and, and a lot of times it, it cost us. When we started the record off, we had some pretty precise plans on songs, styles, disco records, Fleetwood Mac records. We listened to all kinds of stuff that we traditionally wouldn't just put on in our cars. Actually, the, the, the title risk for this album, about as fitting as it gets. A Sadowski five string and the 76 Fender Precision was used to record the album. The music video soon released showed a five string American jazz and a five string quantum with a pearlescent pit guard on the video for Breadline. Whilst on tour, Dave goes on to say he used a pair of four and a pair of five string Fender American P bass deluxes. The 76 position was also used during the encore and put through an Aguilera preamp to match the modulus output. The World Needs a Hero was released in May 2001, and much like the last album, Dave would use Fender Precision Deluxe basses to record it. He would go on to praise their active electronics. The World Needs a Hero tour began in mid-2001, but was cut short due to the attacks of September 11th. The band played two shows in Arizona that November, and filmed and released their very first live DVD, Rude Awakening. On this DVD, you can get a very good look at these basses. That following January 2002, Mustaine was admitted to hospital for a removal of a kidney stone and was administered pain medication which triggered a relapse of his drug addiction. Whilst in rehab, Mustaine fell asleep with his left arm over the back of a chair, causing a compression of the radial nerve. He then subsequently had radial neuropathy, which left him unable to grasp or make a fist with his left hand. On April 3rd, 2002, Mustaine announced he was exiting Megadeth as his arm injury rendered him unable to play guitar. But after just one year of physiotherapy, Mustaine then began work on his own solo album, soon to be called The System Had Failed. Ultimately, due to contractual obligations, the record company was still expecting one more Megadeth album. Long story short, the album had to be released under the Megadeth name, regardless of who was in the band. Mustaine invited members of the Rust in Peace lineup. Unfortunately, Ellison and Marty Friedman could not come to an agreement for the production. Drummer Nick Menza agreed, but was effectively fired by Mustaine due to being insufficiently prepared for the physical demands of the US tour. Mustaine picked a bunch of session musicians to record and play the album live. Moving back to the star of this show, David Ellison. A life without Megadeth came as a relief to Dave. As he states in his autobiography, he was tired of being in a rock band and sacrificing time away from his family. With that said, his main income stream has suddenly dried up and he was in need of an actual job. So we started looking. Dave would be out of Megadeth for eight years, between 2002 and 2010. During this period, a lot of opportunities present themselves to Dave. If you want the full details, head to the show notes linked up above or found down below. In the interest of time for this video, I'm going to streamline it a little bit. Early in this period, Dave worked with PV Electronics and prepared artists to endorse their products mainly to help build a higher profile for their amplifiers and guitars in conjunction with artist endorsements. Some notable artists called into the fold was the late Paul Gray from Slipknot and Nickelback's Mike Kroger. He also had an opportunity to design amplifiers and basses for Peavy. 
One base in particular was the Zodiac series, which we'll cover later on. A few months into his new life and Dave was approached by a friend from Phoenix. The two jammed together for a couple of weeks and eventually formed the band F5. While Dave did mention he was tired of being in a rock band, he stated, the good Lord intended me to have a bass in my hand. It was really the first time that I felt validated for my musical ideas too, but it was still a labor of love. F5 released their first album, A Drug For All Seasons in 2005, and a follow up, The Reckoning in 2008. Dave was seen using a five string silver modulus when recording, as well as a signature PV Zodiac Scorpio and the Fender Precision Deluxe on stage. The Zodiac that Dave plays is one of a kind and built in 2006. It was fitted with Seymour Duncan pickups and active electronics that PV designed. Apart from these bands, Dave also helped to record and produce several albums. He had considered life as a music producer, but soon realized that sitting in a studio all day was not as great as he first thought. Notable production credits include Temple of Brutality, Killing Machine, and Avian. He also attended an audition for the band Soulfly, but admits it wasn't the right time to join full time. He did, however, to help record the album Prophecy, music video, and stood in for a few shows, using a five string concept bass and the Orange Modulus. By 2009, a metal supergroup was formed by the name of Hail, featuring members from Judas Priest, Alice Cooper, and Megadeth. Dave describes the band as, a cool opportunity for us to perform some of our favorite songs together, and for the fans to pay homage to the movement as a whole. The PV Zodiac was used on all of the Hail and the Montreux shows that followed. He commented that the bass has a deep, punchy tone that'll work with anything. There were a few telephone calls with Mustaine over the years in an attempt to try and get Megadeth reunited, none of which came to fruition. Around 2009, a booking agent named John Jackson was preparing to launch his second Sonosphere festival. That December, he announced the big four of thrash metal would be headlining. Metallica, Slayer, Megadeth, and Anthrax. If that wasn't enough, Megadeth soon announced that they were going to tour and celebrate the 20th anniversary of Rust in Peace. Upon hearing the news, Dave said it felt like he was kicked in the gut, also saying, I need to be there for this. I knew it was the right thing to do for our legacy. As if by divine intervention, Dave received a text message from Mustaine's guitar tech, Willie G, and in turn spoke to then current drummer, Sean Drover. Drover explains that the current bassist, James Lomenzo, would be leaving the band. Ending with, dude, if there's ever a time for you to reach out to Mustaine, it is now. Over the course of the next few days, Dave went to jam with Mustaine and Drover. Ellison mentions, the first song we played was Symphony of Destruction, which sounded great. We looked at each other and we knew right away it was going to work. Mustaine then asked Ellison, are we going to do this? Ellison replied nervously, yes. He went home thrilled and I thought to myself, what did I just commit to? Coincidentally, PV were making cutbacks and Dave's job was now considered redundant. I suppose it all works out in the end. He initially signed up for one month of the Rust in Peace tour to ease himself back onto the horse. But of course, this would eventually turn into a permanent position. Dave officially rejoined Megadeth in February 2010 with one of his first appearances on the music video for The Right to Go Insane. The Rust in Peace 20th anniversary tour kicked off that March. The band was so well received that they continued touring Endgame well into the next year. During the first half of the shows, Dave was on stage with a silver custom five string PV Zodiac and a black four string model. For the Rust in Peace portion of the set, Dave went back to his original gear used to record Rust in Peace and had Jackson make him a brand new concert bass. The first one was a black five string concert bass and had three control knobs, just like the old days, followed by a second five string in Quicksilver, which Dave is now synonymous for these days. This bass joined the rig in summer 2010. A brand new BC Rich Mockingbird also joined the lineup and was used on the Encore for Peace Cells. All three were fitted with EMG pickups. From here on out, Dave would rekindle his relationship with Jackson and due to public demand, Jackson released a USA custom shop David Ellison signature model in January 2011. A friend of mine named Rodney over at Rodney McGee has also made a video about Dave's sound. He has this to say about the return to Jackson and BC Rich guitars. Although all the members of Megadeth early on used BC Rich basses and guitars, Dave Ellison moved on fairly quickly and confessed that he was never really happy with his sound during that era. I think it's probably safe to say that he wasn't really 
that dissatisfied with the bases as much as he was the pickups. BC Rich Bases at the time came stock with either a double P setup or a P and J set of DiMarzio's. I think what really gives it away that that was the problem that he had was when he moved to Jackson, he used their stock pickups for a while and then pretty quickly went to EMG that he stuck with to this day. In his characteristic Mockingbird bass that he used in the P-Cells video, he took some Jackson bass pickups and put them into that when swapping out the DiMarzios. So it kind of shows that he still liked that bass and still wanted to use it, but just really wasn't happy with the pickup sound. Later on and recently, for nostalgia's sake, he started bringing out a Heritage Series BC Rich Mockingbird, and even in that one, he hasn't kept the stock pickups. He's put in the EMGs that he's been using all along and to this day still has in all of his bases, including his new signature from Jackson. Dave then collects a handful of new Jacksons from 2010 up until current day, which I'll point out as we go through the albums. Right in the middle of the Endgame tour, the band recorded their 13th album, 13. No specifics about the recording process was released. We do know it was recorded in 10 weeks between May and June 2011. The only gear we do see is in performances at this time. The 13 tour mainly saw Dave using his custom Quicksilver and a black 5 string custom bass for the encore. His rig now consisted of two 5 strings, Quicksilver and Red, as well as two 4 strings. Quicksilver and a blue Kelly bird. On this occasion, a fifth bass was added just for fun. It's a custom signature concert bass, but has artwork created by tattoo artist Craig Christie. The Kelly bird, a fusion of the Jackson Kelly guitar and Gibson Thunderbird bass. It was designed by Dave in 1992. Apart from a prototype or two, nothing really came of it. Then in 2010, Dave and Jackson took another shot at recreating this bass. It's sort of the classic slung low rock and roll bass with the Jackson Kelly guitar horn on the bottom. We sort of integrated some Jacksonism into a nice traditional rock and roll bass. The album 13 was released on November 1st, 2011 with a tour commencing that December right the way through 2012. The tail end of that tour then became the 20th anniversary of Countdown to Extinction of which a live DVD was released and shows all of the basses just mentioned and puts a spotlight on the Red Jackson 5 string. The band ended up touring non-stop for three years between 2011 and 2013, taking a short break over the Christmas holidays before recording Super Collider. Dave states in an article with Gear Gods that he used one of his own Jackson X series to record the album. We went to market with a much less expensive bolt-on version last year. I actually recorded the latest Megadeth record Super Collider with that exact bass. Megadeth put on their own festival that year called the Gigantor. Through these shows, Dave was using this five string neck through USA custom shop, Jackson Kelly Bird, stating, it was a one-off instrument I played for a short period in 2013. Moving forward now, I played the bolt-on four and five string models, usually for piece cells, as this bass was intended to imitate the protruding neck that was inherent on the BC Rich Mockingbirds that I used to record that song with in 1986. During 2014, Dave took part in the Metal Allegiance, another supergroup with its core lineup comprising of Mark Mengi, Alex Skolnick, Mike Portnoy, and Dave on bass. The group is routinely joined by many, many musicians on the road. Their debut album, Metal Allegiance, was released in 2015, and Dave was snap playing his five string custom shop and Fender Precision. The follow up album, Dystopia, was released in 2016. In an interview with Bass Player Magazine, Dave talks about the recording process. While he talks about the amplifiers, stay tuned for part two for that one, he fails to mention the basses specifically. The article, however, lists the equipment he used at the time, which is pretty much every Jackson he has on the market up until this point, not exactly narrowing it down. Also in 2016, Jackson re-released Dave's custom shop basses. Whilst his are custom shops, the retail version also share the same changes. The biggest changes include new ergonomic cutaways, as well as a new placement for the tone control knobs. Dave mentioned that while strumming, his hand would get in the way of the controls. This model now changes that by putting the controls around the edge of the bass. Stepping back a little bit into 2011, Dave and Frank Bellow, bass player for Anthrax, were performing at bass clinics in support of heart key amplifiers. They began writing music together on and off while traveling the world during their clinics known as Metal Masters. 
The result of this partnership was the formation of Altitude and Attitude. By 2014, the pair had released a three-track EP. Only recently, in January 2019, did they release a full-length LP. Dave explains the dynamic of the duo. It's fun, because as bass players we're holding down the lower end of the spectrum and the rhythmic groove section. I think there's always this yearning for us bass players to want to be melodic players. Where these songs are coming from, they're written from a guitar player's perspective, not from a bass player's perspective. Both Frank and Dave play guitar and bass, while Frank does the singing. The interesting part of this duo is that Frank plays an 8-string bass, and Dave plays a 10-string Jackson. Speaking in our current year 2019, Dave has added a few extra basses to his collection. A beautiful navy blue Rickenbacker and a Steve Harris signature precision. A double Jackson guitar bass, a cream coloured Stingray sub, and a couple of acoustic basses. Jackson Guitars also had a new release which came in July 2019. The CBX2 is an interesting release, and I know what you're thinking. That's a Jackson? Yes, that is a Jackson. It has a newly designed headstock and Dave wanted to create something traditional that would appeal to a general audience. It has a few quality of life features too, like the string tree, high mass bridge, and a pit guard. A maple fingerboard for reasons unknown, and PJ pickups just like the old days. The interesting thing here is that the precision pickup is flipped. Dave explains that there's a certain mid-range tone that he dislikes from this position, and flipping the pickup alleviates this. At the time of writing, Autumn 2019, Megadeth are currently in the studio writing their 16th album. Photos have emerged of Dave using a beautiful looking velvet black cherry modulus. You can just make out the orange trans model in the background, as well as some usage of his Red Jackson 5 string. This specific bass was a one-off build for Dave's signature line. The increased scale length of 35 inches adds a piano-like tone to the beat string. However, Dave admits, it also adds fatigue to his left hand and shoulder. Its appearance is limited on tour and mostly used in studio. The latest bass to be seen is a Dingwall Combustion, which Dave has borrowed to record with. And finally, Dave has released a solo record this year named Sleeping Giants. He's joined by a huge collaboration of artists from track to track. The album is presented as a soundtrack to his sequel memoir, More Life With Death. In the debut video, Dave is playing one of the original concert basses with stickers reminiscent of his very first Jackson Quicksilver bass. Take a look at the show notes for a full list of gear that Dave has used over the years. This will include his basses, amplifiers, and effects pedals. Join me in part two where we continue the conversation of Dave Ellison with his amplifiers, effects pedals, and pickups. So hit the subscribe button and click the bell icon so you will be notified when that video is released. I'd like to thank Ron again for sharing his letter and Mr. Big T on Twitter for helping me harass Hartke to get some information. Additionally, I'd like to thank Rodney from Rodney McGee for sharing his knowledge of David Ellison. A link to his David Ellison video and channel are in the description. Go and watch it. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in part two.